Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. Okay, we're sitting in a hunting shack. Fuddle Duck Lodge. Fuddle Duck Lodge. Myself and recurring podcast guest Paul Ballard. Don't even remember him from such episodes as first time hunters, what firearm to look for, what ammunition to look for. And we were talking about fly in hunts. Yeah. Yeah. And we thought, you know, we live in this fantastic province where the hunting opportunities are they're second to none. Yeah. The opportunities, the this the variation in species that's available to a resident hunter here, but it's just a matter of getting to where some of those species are. Right. Yeah, BC, beautiful British Columbia, fantastic hunting opportunities. And I know some people when they think about hunting, they think, well, okay, I'm going to be in remote BC. I want to fly into an area. Jenny, for example, Mm -hmm. you know, Jenny, her very first hunt, she went through her hunter education course. She met somebody else on the course and they decide just to fly in. I think they flew into the itches. They went on a caribou hunt. They were successful, but there's so much that they learned on that hunt that they wished they knew going into it, which would have saved them a whole lot of money, a lot of time. And that's kind of the purpose of this episode here is to try to kind of get people on the right path. Yeah. And I, after doing it, I don't know, 15 or 16 times now, Mm. I go back to that first trip and boy, I learned a substantial amount. And with every subsequent trip, I've learned more. And, you know, it, it, you know, if we can share that bit of experience with, your listeners with the members mm. uh, that are out there, so be it. And we also offer up, you know, the opportunity to ask some questions down the road here and we can help with answering that. Totally. So hopefully we can get through this in one episode. If not, it'll be two episodes. This is an attempt here. I'm doing some remote recording. The hunting lodge that we're in has no power. So we're operating off battery power for the lights, battery power for the cameras, battery power for the audio. So it's all a learning experience. Wood power over here is keeping us warm. A little wood power to the side. We'll do a pan around. Maybe we'll throw that in yeah, as the yeah. intro so people can kind of see what the uh, the area here looks like. And, and what nobody knows is we have two DAWGs in the room as well. So if you hear a little bit of whining in the background, they want to get back out to the marsh. They do. So fly-in hunting, a lot of things to consider. We're looking at kit, uh, clothing, food, um, looking at accommodation, sleep systems, uh, and tents, we're looking at And let's kind of break, break it down, sort right. of, you know, the first and foremost thing to consider is what species do you want to pursue and what part of the province do you want to go to? Mm-hmm. So as you mentioned, the Itcha Mountains, which, you know, it is known for its caribou. Mm. Uh, that portion that goes, uh, region six is still open at mm-hmm. the north end of the itches and, and up into the Cassiars for, for caribou. So, mm. uh, an individual wants to pursue caribou, you pick a location and there you go. Um, I've been fortunate enough to harvest a caribou on a flying trip. I wouldn't, have, it would have never occurred to me to go on a, a drive-in, uh, hunt for that. And I, you know, we, we say in flying, but you know, honestly fly in, um, jet boat, 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 yes. Almost identical, uh, for, you know, your weight restrictions, gear restrictions, space, 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 especially it's shocking. People, a lot of, you know, they look at these as being the one truck trucks of the, of the rivers, but they don't have a lot of room. They've got right. a, they are very, very thirsty beasts. So a lot of what's taken up in deck space or storage space is, 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 45 gallon drums full mm-hmm. of fuel. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, a lot of the outfitters will go out and stash fuel and, and, you know, have it that way, but it, it's a similar thing. So, um, there are some options between the two. Uh, I have not done a uh, jet boat trip, but I've talked to enough people uh, comparatively and I think I'd stay with aircraft. Yes. A jet boat can get you in as long as the water's high enough. 
a little bit later in the season in mm-hmm. some cases. Mm-hmm. But that is the issue. As you get later in the season, the trade-off is, you know, the, if the water's going down. But, you know, the issue being with aircraft later on in the, in the season, freeze up, it's a no-go. So most of this is going to happen uh, before about the 8th of, of October. So we're talking for a northern British Columbia hunt, uh, a lot of the seasons start to open early in August, mid-August mm-hmm. for the moose uh, and the elk. And then with the closures on, you know, those species actually going much further, the reality is you got to plan on being out of there towards the very first week of October. Mm-hmm. When people are planning for these hunts, they're going to be taking time off work. They're going to get their friends to coordinate perhaps. Maybe they're going all by themselves, which is... A daunting endeavor. Boy. Um, but there's a mindset that goes with it as well. If you're coming from a built up area, you're coming from a city environment and you're used to being able to go to your corner store and get your conveniences and having uh, the competitive market of, of businesses around being Johnny on the spot for you, that changes a little bit when you get start talking to bush pilots. Well, yes. And boat captains and weather as well. Right. And as you know, because you've done it, um, once you uh, once you land there, they're not coming back to bring you toilet paper. Mm-hmm. You know, if you've forgotten something, you've got to you've got to have that contingency plan for everything mm-hmm. as you go in. You know, many people go on a drive in hunt and all of a sudden realize that they've forgotten something essential. Uh, one of the parties is going to turn around and drive out to go get whatever's needed, and then probably get some other bonus and then come back. Mm. And that option really isn't there. And Particularly no. with the pilots, even though you might uh, take some form of communication in with them, it's not a taxi service. You set a date that you want to get in, no guarantees that, you know, the weather's going to cooperate, but mm. to the best of their ability, they'll get you in, you know, within a day or two of what you wanted to get in on. Mm. And then, of course, the later you go in the season, it's that coming out, are you going to be right on time? So you always got to have that big contingency plan when you plan to do this. These are the dates I want to do. And boss... If I'm not back at work on this day, we couldn't get out of the bush and uh, I'll be, you know, back to work whenever I can. And that's definitely something that has to be accounted for and a high level of um, ingenuity, being able to figure out how to get by with things that you will inevitably forget, or maybe you brought, but stops working or broke. I keep going back to redundancy. So where we've gone wrong on trips is a rifle broke. Mm. I had, uh, yeah, it happened to me once. Then it's, I think, two other folks now on other, you know, parts of our party have had a rifle that's non-serviceable. So that's, you know, if you're going to go in with four guys, maybe you can forego something else for weight to put one more rifle into the the camp so that you've got uh, a way to make up. Or if there's just two of you going, you share one guy's rifle once the other one breaks. But uh, we were in grizzly country. I was convinced that the 300 Winchester short magnum was the way to go. I got one of the very first production rifles made by that W company. I guess mm-hmm. it, it's a different company now, right? Yeah, yeah. So I can actually say it. And that rifle completely failed on me um, about two days into a 12 or 14 day trip. What happened? <laughs> I couldn't get the bolt open. So once the bolt closed, I could not shy of anything but beating it with a piece of wood, open the bolt, extract the cartridge that was in there. So I had a single shot firearm. Right. Uh, it would fire, but then I wouldn't be able to work the bolt were afterwards. You, were you loading your own ammo or is that factory ammo? You know what? That was factory ammo because okay. that was, I didn't even have dies for the short magnum, the 300 short magnum. This mm. would have been, oh, probably about 2002. Okay. 2003 maybe, and that rifle had only come out, you know, a year or so before. And the cartridge was about five years old by that time, but I was convinced it was the way to go. And I put my beloved 30-06 aside, which yeah. never gave me any problems, and killed a lot of game, <laughs> but I took that uh, that Magnum plunge and there was my problem. Well, from my perspective, I think the very first thing somebody should be looking at if they're planning a fly-in hunt or a boat-in hunt would be just the mindset, getting the mind in the right place. And that can be assisted by understanding some of the variables that are involved 
And it can also be assisted by going out and practicing a bit with your kit, practicing a oh, bit yeah. with... Uh, developing some bushcraft skills. Developing bushcraft skills. Like if you're not a person that's, that's used to sleeping on the ground, mm. you need to work on that because... You'll figure it out quick. I mean, let's... You can go on a flying trip in the lap of luxury. Mm. It all depends on how much money you've got because they will, you know, keep flying more gear in, more gear in, more gear in. But come a point, you know, it, it becomes out of the reach of the common guy. Mm-hmm. You know? And so what I would like to say is that this is, uh, if you want to save up for it, this is as affordable as a, a 10-day all-inclusive vacation in Mazatlan or something like that. Mm. It, it's kind of equivalent. Mm-hmm. It really is. So if you want to do, you know, 10 or 12 days in a, in a remote northern lake, uh, it's about the same as a, a good all-inclusive type of vacation. Five-star, of mm. course. <laughs> of course. But the accommodations are not going to be five-star. If you want five-star, then it's probably going to cost you almost it's safe to say thousands of dollars more. So I did a, um, fly in into the Spetsies area. Yes. And, uh, we arrive, we've got our kit, we've got the right mindset. We've all been exercising ahead of time, wearing the packs we're going to be wearing, taking them up the mountain. Everybody who's on the trip is capable and, and confident in their kit and their abilities. Uh, and accounting for weight, of course, because mm-hmm. weight's going to be an issue. And we got in and there's one other group that came in and the first plane that landed was only one passenger on it and cooler and cooler and tote and cooler after one after the other, bringing in all their beer, bringing in all their food, all the luxuries that they want. Next plane came in, brought some more passengers and some more kit. Holy crow, the amount of stuff that these people had. And there's a fellow, um, uh, Mark Twight. Uh, if they, I've talked about him before, he's going to be on the podcast at some point in the future. Uh, but he has written a book on extreme alpinism and he takes an approach, which I think is, uh, similar that should be used for the, uh, person who's going to be going out and hunting or doing a fly-in trip, which is the more kit that you have with you, that's going to make you comfortable can actually jeopardize your safety can really slow you down, make you spend way much, way more time in the mountains than you necessarily need to. And he goes fast, he goes hard, he goes light, but he turns around. Like if there's an issue, he'll turn back down to a base camp and he'll, he'll make sure that he's, uh, uh, watching the weather systems. So he, he takes a very minimalist approach. These guys came in took a very maximalist approach. One of the guys forgot his tags, which, it was a whole other story on this. So that's something if people are listening, read Make a list. Make a list, yeah. right? Make sure you have your and, and it And that list ends with a check mark as everything goes mm. on. To the pl- I went in uh, to a, a northern lake. Uh, we were in for elk, mm. a very steep terrain. We had met as a group. There was six, seven in that hunting party. So we were going in uh, two flights with a, a de Havilland otter. Uh, but we knew what our weight con- restrictions were. So we made a determination. We had X number of pounds for the camp. That means the tents, uh, the axe, the chainsaw, the big stuff that, you know, was, you know, for everybody to use. Mm. And then each hunter had a weight allowance. And let's just say it was your pack rifle was 70 pounds. Mm. So Everything you got to bring besides yourself, 70 pounds. That meant if you were going to bring liquor, if you were going to bring, uh, you know, a super duty air mattress or anything, you had 70 pounds. Mm. We took all of our stuff where one of the fellows had a set of horse scales and we were weighing everything, marking on it, what everybody's weight were. There's some other stories to this, but the point I want to make (laughs) is all of our kit was at one place. We loaded it all into a trailer at this place and we let, set off two days later for the air base to fly in from. Sure. And I kept saying, you know, people were helping with the kit and everything else like this. Anybody see my boots? Yeah, yeah, I put a pair of boots in the plane. I saw your boots go in the plane. I saw your boots go in the plane. Well, my boots never even got in the trailer. Come on. From what we did. So I had gum boots yeah. and Crocs. That yeah. was it. And I... I fit one of the other guys had a spare pair of boots, so I kind of could wear those. They weren't right, but you know, it, it got me around a little bit, but that's, that's tragedy. Like 
boots. That boots. is your, you know, your your hunting boots is everything on those type of trips. Mm-hmm. More kind of on that later, but you know, you just planning is everything. So Plan- having a, having so a list. list, yeah. So let's pick. You know, we've kind of said you're going to find the spot you're going to go. Mm. That's going to be up to you. Everybody knows how to do their research. I hope. You, know, you got to talk to other hunters. Uh, you start interviewing these packer outfitters that are up there. Mm-hmm. Uh, in most cases, guides are not going to be a huge amount of help because you're a resident hunter uh, in British Columbia in particular. You're a resident hunter. You can go anywhere you want in this province. Their hunting concession is not private property mm-hmm. uh, and therefore they're not going to help you by uh, wanting you to come into that cherry spot that they have, you know, mm-hmm. they've got, they've got money to make big, big money to make on this. And they're not interested in a lot of cases of even entertaining, taking a resident hunter into their camp. Mm-hmm. So you've got to look at the guy who makes his money by taking you in there, whether he takes you in by aircraft, by jet boat, or by even horseback. Mm-hmm. They can't guide you. They can't put you on animals. They can say, Yes, from this camp, the last time I picked somebody up, they came out with two elk or mm. they came out with a sheep or whatever. They'll go that far, but they're not gonna they're not gonna put you on animals. That's 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 where the conflict between a guide and a packer really exists. You know what I mean? You know one of the areas so you're talking about doing the research and talking to different people. Uh, how you talking to another hunter, they might not put you on, right? Maybe yeah. if they're out of the area and they've already been in, they might say, Okay, now that I'm done, I'll, I'll let you know what I've seen. Um, what some people will do is they'll go on to like Facebook groups for hikers, mm-hmm. Reddit groups for hikers. If you're in an area where it's going to be frequented by fishermen hikers or anglers, because they'll be talking and you, like oh, Reddit. I said fishermen, I should have said anglers. Right. Well. How politically incorrect of me. <laughs> <laughs> so you can actually put flags on it, like in Reddit and say, give me an email if this word comes up or if they talk about this. So you go into a hunting forum and sorry. You, yeah. You go into a hunting forum, you try and put those flags and everyone's tight lipped. Mm-hmm. You go into a hiking forum and people will say, oh, I saw a moose. I, you should have seen the antlers and, or I saw whatever it is. And those are your key words. And all of a sudden you start getting emails and you can, you can either try and suss out the proximity from where they're talking about, or you can message them directly. And quite often people are, are happy to share that with you. It's, it's all about any hunting trip is all about the intel go, mm. before you go in. Huge. You know, you, you can put together, you know, the time of year, the potential for the rut being on, all these other things, but animals are in pockets. They're in pockets. Game is always in pockets. And if somebody's been seeing a lot, then that's probably the likely place to go. Mm. Um, again, the outfitter, the packer that's taking you into these places, he might or she might want to take you to a place where it's a good lake to land, knows there's some good camps and everything else, mm. but there hasn't been a hare come out of there in, you know, a couple of seasons. They're not going to tell you that. Right. You know, they're, you know, they're happy to say there are animals there. You're going to read lots of the blogs where people are talking about, you know, the stuff has come out of there. It's been good traditionally. Mm. You read some of the old books, you know, those are, you know, some of the other ones like right now, caribou's in jeopardy. There's no open, mm. there's no open season caribou in, in seven. Mm-hmm. You have to go to six for any open caribou, right? Mm. So, you know, you're, you're looking at, uh, or is, no, I think 7A, there might be some caribou still open, but. I can guarantee you somebody in the comments will let us know. Yeah. Uh, Within a heartbeat, <laughs> yes. because there's nothing more important than to correct some loud mouth <laughs> on a podcast and make sure that you knew more than he did. And yeah, that's, that's, and, and can I just say, I don't ahead. know it all. I do not know it all, <laughs> but I know some stuff. There's a, a very interesting, and this is totally an aside, but the Guinness book of world records was yes. created by the Guinness beer company. Yeah. Guinness beer company says, how do we get people into bars drinking more beer? And they said, well, they like football, right? Soccer. And, uh. People seem to like trivia. So maybe if we made a book with trivia in it, it would keep them, you know, eating pretzels and nuts and drinking beer more. How do we make this book on trivia? Well, I guess we've got to figure out who the fastest runner is and the highest jumper. And some bright person said, no, we'll just make those stats up ourselves because people are more inclined to correct us than they are to give us that information. So they made up the stats to begin with and they found that uh, they didn't have to pay people for information because people would jump on the boat and correct them right away. Okay, dear listener, it's up to you to make this right. We'll do our best going for it. So where were we? You pick your location, you pick, 
you, you start to interview the outfitters in the area, and some of them are, are legit, and read ratings that other people have given them. I tend to look, oh, five-star rating. You know, 95% of the people that have rated this guy has given him five stars. I go immediately start at the one-star workup from that mm-hmm. and just see what kind of things. And usually, you know, you can read between the lines. Somebody's given him one star because, I don't know, they didn't give him a cham- champagne on the flight or something right. like that. Yeah, And and everybody's got a bad day. So if, if it looks good, then that's the person. Hmm. Typically, um, if you book far in advance, you're going to get a discount on the flights. Mm-hmm. It's an awful time in the world for fuel costs. So mm. when I first did a fly-in trip, I think it cost under $1,000 for each guy. I'm not talking just the airfare. I'm talking virtually everything. Right. You know, from the fuel to drive from, you know, the lower mainland up to the north uh, to, to take the flight in, uh, the you know, one flight plus a, an extra flight that was bringing out the, the harvest with us. Mm. So, you know... It, to where four years ago, five years ago, must have been five years ago. The the last one, uh, we were ta- probably talking about 2500 per person. You're probably looking at about three grand now. Yeah. You easy. know, on, on, a, on a shared camp situation. So, you know, expect it to, you know, put some money away for this thing. But expect it to be between three and forty five hundred dollars. And just what you're comparing that to is you are now potentially hunting where people will pay a guide forty thousand dollars US to pursue that sheep mm. on the same mountain that you now have wide open to you. Mm-hmm. Okay. They may have the experience and everything else, but you've now got the out of pocket spending to give you that determination to get up and work that hill. Mm-hmm. And and there it is. That's that's the motivation. Is the hunting easier on a fly in trip? Hell no. Hell no. If you be able to go on a moose hunt and you be able to drive a truck within two hundred yards of, you know, the dead moose and you gotta yard it down the hill. You know, we've all been there, sure. right? And, that's, and we complain about how tough that was going through the buck brush and the, you know, and, or you came <laughs> coming out of a logging cut, cut block and the slash that you climbed over. Oh man, that was really tough. Well, shoot a moose six miles from where your base camp is and every ounce of that edible portion of that animal has got to go on your back. Mm-hmm. And if there's two of you, that means however many trips. And you see a moose is, in my experience, boned out about nine full packs. Mm. And that's a reasonable amount for a, you know, a good fit man, woman to, uh, to carry, to care, to carry from, from the place of the kill back to the camp, yeah. you know, and, and then they're in, you know, in these remote situations lies some of the other some of the other issues that, you know, normally you can leave bones in, in a quarter of moose. You're not probably going to do that on a fly. No. And so that, and that, of course, those are the dogs we hear in the background. They're, <laughs> they're pretty eager to get back out and do a little bit of hunting, but. Well, uh, who's not, but nope. you know, it is hunting season. It is, but there's some useful information here. And I figure if we just take a little bit of time, we'll have it in posterity for people for a long time. All right. So uh, we've, we've kind of. You know, shot around. So now we've we've picked our species. We found an outfitter. The questions to ask. Okay, what type of equipment are they going to take in? When I say equipment, what what's the aircraft? You know, what's the weight carrying of the aircraft? So usually, like the you know the the one one eighty twos. Yeah, one eighty two Cessna. That's about six hundred pounds plus the pilot. Mm. So you get two two hundred fifty pound guys. There's five hundred pounds. You get another hundred pounds of gear. That's all you're allowed. So you mm-hmm. got to think about that. Mm-hmm. You know, often uh, people going in, in in the 182s, you know, they might have to go two flights in like that to, to get it. Or now you start looking who's flying a beaver. A de Havilland, yeah. Yeah. So the de Havilland beaver is about a thousand pounds plus, mm-hmm. the, plus the pilot. And then you go up to the Otter, which is like the one ton truck of the sky. Mm-hmm. It's about 2,000 pounds, you know, and, and it just goes on and on and on. And they... You know, basically, you can't cheat it. There's a great big scale right there on the dock. Mm-hmm. And you climb on that scale, they weigh you. So, you know, and we've had guys trying to cheat stuff, uh, you know, by loading up their pockets. And the pilot weighs you before you get on. And they're mm-hmm. pretty sharp. Because, honestly, people's lives depend on on that, that uh, you know, critical balance of the aircraft, how much weight's, you know, on there. Mm-hmm. So it is serious. So you picked your outfitter. You got your weight limit. Start thinking. Now, 
you got to start planning on equipment. Of course, first thing is going to everybody, well, this is the caliber rifle I'm going to take. This is the scope that's going to be on it. Eh, think about safety and, and you know, your sur- ultimate survival because mm-hmm. the potential is there. The weather turns, the atmospheric river, as we all experience now, <laughs> shows up, and you're going to be days, mm. a week longer. There's been guys that, you know, I've told stories of being in two weeks longer than what they expected. There's been guys who have had, you know, the sound of a helicopter is the first thing they hear, and a helicopter is coming in as a rescue. And, right. and I mean, that's the obligation that the, you know, the, the, the packer has. If mm-hmm. they can't fly in... A helicopter can take much worse weather, but none of your hunting gear is coming out. Mm -hmm. You're coming out. You're coming out. That's it. If the helicopter comes in, uh, you know, you better spray your rifles down with lots of oil, soak up some, your sleeping bag. So maybe in the spring you can go back and get your stuff. But Mm -hmm. you know, that, that really is the truth. They can't transport your rifle. They can't transport any of your meat. Mm. any of that they're going to just bring you in a limited amount of gear out if the helicopter goes in well you've had experiences where you've been out and a couple days are going by without the pilot coming in oh yeah yeah you want to try that one on for size so you know you're counting down and of course everybody's getting a little bit on everybody's nerves <laughs> uh-huh. you that's know another point yeah you, and and that's the thing you need to pick if you're going to go with a group you better you know like the guys that you're going with a lot of cases a solo hunter you're probably in love with yourself, so it's going to be, <laughs> you know, there's no question of when you're going to eat, how far you're going to go each day because you're making those decisions. Mm-hmm. You know, as soon as you add that next person in, then there's always an issue. And it's a good idea to to pick somebody that you've been on a few trips with before and you know what each other's limitations are. And then that's the other thing too, is you set that, um, hey, if I get under your skin, you got to tell me. There's nothing worse than people that do slow boils, you know, underneath, and mm. then all of a sudden the pot, you know, comes comes apart, right? You know, the the lid blows off, and there's a big fight. It's when you say, "Look, you got to stop doing whatever you're doing because it's starting to really bug me," and don't be afraid to say it. And the other guy's got to have enough. The other person's got to have thick enough skin to accept that. That's a really good point when going and choosing the people you're going to be with. It doesn't matter if you guys are best buds. When you're going days without food and you're lugging your whole life on your back up and down hills. Well, well, here's how it goes. Attitudes can change. You know, come down at a sheep camp, you know, after one guy's success, we've been down there. uh, We're in base camp, harvest a... Oh, a moose, two moose, Mm -hmm. another elk, uh, and a caribou on that trip. So everything's looking good. Uh, We've got a, you know, we're coming out heavy. There's no question about it. Uh, We're all set up. This is the exit day. The lake we're on is beautiful. Mm. Bluebird skies. The weather's nice. There's no wind or anything else. Collapse the base camp, pack everything up, get everything down to the beach. You're ready for the aircraft to arrive. And tick tock, tick tock, sitting around, get your pocketbooks out, you're reading, waiting, enjoying a little bit of sun, sightseeing, and four o'clock comes that there's and there's no sound of an aircraft. Mm-hmm. Pull the tents out, go back up, get a fire going, pull the stoves out, have a meal and everything else for four nights mm-hmm. doing that. And that's really where you saw. You know, there's the food is now down to, you know, freeze diet food. There's, you know, the you know, they're Stuff's gone, right? You're you're down to sort of minimal rations. So this is the thing. Always plan, you know, for that unexpected. So again, with the redundancy thing, yeah, I've got enough food for 10 days. Let's make it enough food for 15 days. And if if things start to happen, then we know we can sort of start rationing what remains. Uh, What's really different now, though, is the opportunity to take communications with you. We first started going, there was sat phones, but they were so friggin' expensive, nobody even thought to take them. Our emergency signal was an orange tarp on the beach, and hopefully if the pilot flew over, they'd see it. So we are younger, uh, and fortunately nothing big ever happened. But I kind of think back on that, I couldn't do it anymore. So mm. uh, having that ability to communicate with the pilot by satellite link of some form, and they can either text you or you've got your sat phone to say, hey, look, we're not coming in for, you know, several days. That's a, it's a nice heads up to have. Spot 
Inreach Zolio. Oh, the yeah. new iPhones have satellite communications on them for SOS. But there's one thing that you mentioned that I thought was kind of an interesting point just to kind of hammer home. We're talking about the group, the people that you're going up with. Yeah. Uh, it's like getting into a contract. People say, well, I got this contract in place, so if things go wrong, I can sue you. Well, no, you've got a contract in place, so you don't have to reach that point. Because so, everybody knows the ground w- rules going into the the whatever it is that they're entering into a contract on. So entering it in with your mates who you're going to be out in the back country with and saying, look at, here's some things that really annoy me and... I'll give you a heads up if it starts happening, or if I haven't eaten in a while, I can get cranky, or here's some... Or the other thing, too, is to have somebody that can intervene when two of the people are starting to go loggerheads, the, the third person in the group, you know, if you have more than two on that on that, uh, on that that hunt, that can be helpful as mm. well. I mean, i got to be honest, the guys I've flown in with, um, shy of a few in the first part, and then a couple of the bigger groups, like sometimes these things get out of hand. I think four is an ideal number. Mm. Two is an ideal number. You start going beyond that and getting five or six people, and and it, it, what tends to happen is it's just we just throw money at the at the packer, and they just take another flight, take mm. another flight, take another flight, and we've had you know as many as seven, and I think eight actually in one flight, and that was just too much. Mm. First of all, you get too many people working the area, so you, it's almost like being in you know the the road access areas there's so many other mm-hmm. hunters i mean the, the area is vast that you're in but there's only so far you can travel right yeah exactly so yeah you know it's good if a portion of the group is going to spike out and and put a spike camp you know for sheep or or something like that where the other guys are going to focus on elk yeah that, that works mm. that works uh, and there's a potential so you've got a great base camp for the the sheep hunters to come back to you know for uh for, for, you know, taking care of their hides and this sort of stuff. There's, there's all, you know, some security in having big numbers like that. Everybody's got more eyes out for, you know, for, for predators. If they're going to cause you a problem, if bears are going to come around, that's all, you know, it's okay. But boy, when you decide to go, you got to make sure you're going to love those people, you know, a little bit more than you think. Well, this one group I'm talking about that brought all of the kit in, um, we got up early in the morning, we're hiking up the mountain and, you know, going slow. We got our packs on, we got what we need for the day. We're just going to do a quick day recce, check, yep. check the place out. In behind us, these guys come running up, they're up drinking all night. So they woke up a little bit later and they're in shorts and runners and they're running up the mountain and there's my son. He's like, oh, are they going to find the animals before we do? And we told him, I said, don't worry about it. You just, you just watch. We'll just keep plugging through. We do our thing. We'll be good, right? Lots of area. Anyways, we gaining elevation, gaining elevation, getting colder, turned into a bit of, this is in August, a uh, snowstorm comes up. One guy is just out on the trail by himself. The rest of the group were split up and they went around the side. He looks like he's almost in tears because he's tired and hungry and cold and doesn't know where the other people are and says he wants to go home. This is day one for them. He says they're already fighting. They're already arguing. And these guys were best buds in the city. The mountains will bring out things in you, which you might not know of. Maybe go for a trip with your buddies ahead of time. Yeah. And we've, you know, we've had that happen on a couple of trips where Mm. you didn't know some of the guys and boy, did you get a surprise, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's not good. That's not good. So yes, it's good to do a couple of, you know, those four truck hunts where if you do have that fight, you just get in your truck and leave, you know, <laughs> yes. that, that's, that kind of, kind of works. I mean, your relationship and my, you know, with mm-hmm. our relationship is one that I don't think, you know, we're going to, we're going to do, do this one day together, but our, so far our hunts have been great. We'll be just fine. We just, you know, I know that, you know. We understand each other's quirks. Gotcha. You know, yes. I like that. So, but, uh, it is, it is important to know the group that you're going with. Getting back to it. So you know the group that you're going with. It's not a taxi service. You're mm-hmm. going to be in there for a set period of time. Weather plays a huge yeah. role. Well, and then there's the other thing too. When you're sitting there about to make a play on a nice bull caribou and uh, that you spotted from the outhouse in the... <laughs> <laughs> that exist up there, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, so you run back, get your, your pack board on, and you, you know, get your rifle, and you're starting to go, and all of a sudden, hey, 
there's our pilot coming in. We've only been in for a few days. And he comes in and he's got a weather report in his hand. And he says, you guys, you really need to think about how much longer you stay. You either come out now or you're going to be in for days, days mm. and days longer mm. than what you expected. So that was one of those unfortunate times we had to call it, you know, call it short and, and go out. So, And I'll add to that, if your pilot comes back and says that, these bush pilots, particularly in British Columbia, are a different breed. They are. Pay special heed to what they say. They're built a little bit different. Yeah. And, and I'll give an example. We had a, um, uh, a fly-in for fishing. And uh, flying into a lake, this guy's got, uh, he flies into this area for the outfitters for moose, and he built his own little cabin out there for fishing, and he's got an accord with them. I won't bring anybody on my own in for hunting, just for fishing, because I bring your guys in for, for hunting. Yeah. And so anyways, he had a, we've flown with him before on other trips and he had a helper this time. This guy was really nice, really friendly and helped load the, the plane up and got everything ready. Pilot comes down, we're flying off and, and, uh, first thing I said, I said, well, what happened to your 182? And he's like, well, you know, I don't mean to scare you, but these things break all the time, right? <laughs> they're, uh, they're old planes. And so he goes into this whole thing and. Then we're talking about his helper and said, um, oh, the, how fantastic it was and how much it's going to help him. And, and as we're flying in, he keeps taking pictures and I'm looking around. I'm like, there's nothing really photographic, scenic that he's taking pictures of. So finally I say, what are you taking pictures of? He's like, oh, just the weather patterns. I want to show the new guy kind of what it looks like and okay. And what he can expect. And as we're flying further and further, we're about an hour and a half into it. And he says, okay, next bend, we're going to see what our window looks like. I don't know about the weather. To me, the weather looked pretty darn good, right? And he says, I don't know about this. We might not be able to get in. Okay, fair enough. Lands us quick, all of our stuff off, bang, he's gone. A week later, he comes, picks us up. Of course, during this time, the fridge that we were supposed to have there didn't work. So thankfully, we could catch fish because all of our fresh food ends up only lasting so long. It's another consideration. Kit can break. Picks us up after um, my seat breaks in the plane and we figure a way to kind of get that thing together as we're I'm doing a permanent ab crunch as we're coming out here. I'm asking him, I said, well, how's the new pilot working out? He says, oh, he quit. I'm like, what? What do you mean he quit? He said, yeah, I came back. I showed him those pictures that I took and he said he didn't have the stomach for it. He flew helicopters commercially for uh, skiing. He flew to Havilland Beavers for logging companies, but this is 10 minutes up, 10 minutes down. This is 20 minutes here. These bush pilots are going out one, two hours out, weather systems change, things can change. They're built differently. If they come in with a caution, don't think that perhaps you know better than them because there's a good possibility their threshold for danger and fear in the air exceeds yours. Right. And that's, and that's the thing. So if they say they don't want to fly, because we've flown and you're thinking, <laughs> really? <laughs> and yeah, and then, uh, you, you know, you, you want to get a hand on that air sickness bag before you head in, because <laughs> when that thing like loses, you watch the altimeter just dialing like crazy and, and you know, you've just lost 400 feet just like that. And wow. you know, your stomach is still up there. <laughs> yeah. It, it, and it, <laughs> What kind is for a flying trip sitting in the back seat and there's an alarm that goes off in the aircraft that, you know, just keeps going on and on and on. Whenever they, as soon as he started up, I don't know what it is, yeah, but it's he nothing to, to worry about. Every sure. plane does it. And you can hear him because we all have headsets and, you know, mics on and, and he, he's going, can anybody else hear that alarm? <laughs> you know, it, and it is, it's unnerving to, to people to, to go up there, but it is worth it. The scenery from the flight is just stupendous mm -hmm. spotting game on the tops of these mountains as That's you're hitting it, it's just oh, it's worth the price of admission you know absolutely seeing where you, and then and then coming in and he says see that lake up in the you know in you know at the 11 o'clock there that's where we're going and you go wow and it's like a, a pinpoint you know and you near it you near it and you start to descend and just seeing the trees start to rise up and then mm. this crystal clear lake that you land on there's nothing like it yeah it's not easy hunting but it's great hunting and it's a great experience and you know <laughs> the beaches up there that look like something out of the Bahamas and some of these mm. lakes. You can't believe it. Sometimes you get in there and it's like the, I remember the 4th of October and, and of course I deal in Fahrenheit, 98 degrees 
for you know wow. midday at one day up there where it had been down well below zero for a week before we were up there. Just weird, you know. Mm, mm. Weather is is a thing, and and it's a it's an issue. But getting back to it, pick a good pilot. Pick a, a pilot with a safe record. Pick a pilot who is serious about what he's doing, the weights, all those things. Um, these guys are in the tourism business. When they're not taking hunters and anglers in, they're taking sightseers in. You know, they they you know they're they're up to talking to you. Mm. Quite often, you know, in if you go one of the outdoor hunting or angling shows, a lot of times these pilots will be there. They'll have maps. They'll have ideas. They'll have suggestions. So once you've made that selection, we're digressing. Well, I was talking a little bit about before you plan. What kind of kit you want to go in? You want to have that safety equipment. So communication now is everything. Mm. Once you've figured out what you want to take, be a sat phone, uh, one of the you know text type communicators, any of those, they all seem to work good. I know you and I are both using InReach. Mm-hmm. Uh, shameless plug for them. Uh, the, but Garmin the, has got a great product there, and it works. And it works well. Uh, Zolio is another one that's been rated quite well based on how they work. Yeah. Uh, downside is you need to, it'll send an SOS or I think a couple of uh, predetermined messages, but you need to have your phone integrate. And if you want to type something out. Right. Whereas the inReach can, it'll fail back to the instruments. Right. It's nice to have your, your, your smartphone beside you. And then mm. they just wirelessly way easier way to type. Yes. So the brick, I think is another one that yes. people talk about. We see that being used, but we're regardless, you should plan on it. Mm-hmm. And uh, if not, if all else, you can rent a sat phone. You can, right. you know, they're available at the airport. You can order one. They deliver it by, you know, whatever Amazon or whatever delivery company is there. And then you just mail it back after the thing's over. One caveat though, uh, you've rented sat phones. I've rented sat phones. Uh, they don't always work. They don't work very, yeah, they're surprising. And then that's the other thing too is, you know, Figure out which network it's on because uh, um, I don't want to name names, but you know, sure. one, you know, they they said the pilot looks and goes, "Oh, you've bought that one. Those aren't really good up here." <laughs> so if you're planning on bringing a sat phone, ask the pilot what they're using. Mm. Okay, ask him if he has the ability. If you're going to send text to him or her, uh, or are you going to have to do it through a third party or something like mm-hmm. that? And then. All in all, remember that SOS on there. That's calling out, you know, the the world search and rescue right. network for you, and it's not going to go directly to the pilot. That's important. So, communication very important. A lot of guys get up there, and when you have that emergency sat phone, they're phoning home and everything else. Now you get homesick, and people want to go home. Right, so, right. So. <laughs> It is what it is, you know, sure. you know, having that can be, it can be, it can be a bit of a curse, but boy, in the, in the event of an emergency, it's worth having. Talk about communication. First fly in trip, nine eleven. We were the first flight the pilot was legally allowed to do after the grounding of nine eleven. So mm. I think we went in on the 14th or the 15th of September and the party that we were bumping off of the lake that we were going to. So the pilot, typically the way they work is they like to take you in somewhere where they're picking somebody else up and it may be actually on a direct spot. Mm. So we went in and there were a bunch of firefighters, some retired firefighters and, and a, you know, with a big link. And it was, you know, my 9-11 moment was, was, you know, telling these guys that the World Trade Center had come down, both mm. towers. And, and a great loss of life amongst the firefighting community. Mm. And it was just, I get goosebumps now when I think about it. It was just a moving moment. But it's all about, you know, the point being communication. You right. Know? And, uh, and go for there. Radios, I don't think, are going to be the right thing. You've got to gotta really know how to put some kind of monster antenna up, and you're going to be... If you know like, what you're doing with the radio, maybe, but most people don't, and that's extra weight yeah, that you're yeah. bringing. And and that's it. The, the thing with the inReach, it's idiot-proof. Now, right. you got to remember, you got a finite battery life on these rechargeable devices. So mm. uh, a power pack may now be the thing that you need to consider in your weight load. Mm. Uh, so even these little power packs that'll jumpstart your car and things like that, a lot of them will give you sufficient charges for you know a 10-day or a week-long uh, trip so that you can keep your devices, both your, you know, cause 
who's bringing a camera anymore? Except you. <laughs> uh, most people are going to bring their their cell phone in right. to take pictures, so you got to charge that up. Um, you know, it's it's not going to be using a lot of data, but you know, you want to get those nice files on the on your phone. Mm. Uh, the beautiful scenery and so many phones take better pictures than any of the cameras, and they're light and easy to carry. Small solar system, a uh, solar panel, yeah. uh, a battery system that can, you can just leave out to charge up so you right. don't plug your device directly into the solar panel, yeah. and then you can come back and charge up. Your phone, right. which is a fantastic navigational tool, we'll see how the iPhone, whatever it is now, 15s, 14s, uh, well, do the, with their sat The thing is, if you leave your phone on the whole time... It's, you know, it doesn't have to be a satellite communication. I mean, it's just doing it by, yeah. you know, whatever voodoo lives with inside that machine <laughs> that I don't understand. But, yeah, it could be used for navigation, whether your maps and everything are, are on there. So we've got communication. We just talked about navigation. A map and compass never run out of batteries. Right. But you and, have to know how to use them. Right. And, and I am really fortunate because, you know, more than 50 years of using maps and compasses, I don't really feel the obligation to use my GPS to navigate. I, right. I feel totally confident with just the map and compass and, you know, showing people the wonders of how to do, you know, a resection on a map yeah. with your compass to show exactly where you are. Mm. And when people are saying, well, I can't do that, and they're checking their GPS, and sure enough, the coordinates are the same, mm -hmm. and then whoop! The GPS lights go out, <laughs> and what do you do now? And right. and that was one of the things that I noticed when we first started carrying GPS on on any hunting trip. They weren't rechargeable, and they just sucked those batteries up. You probably mm -hmm. had to carry pounds worth of you know double A batteries to keep putting back into your little you know what was it the three three sixty Garmin three sixty or okay, something like sure. that. Sure, had the little tiny screen on it mm. but like i say map and compass the e-trex yeah it's got it yeah e-trex that's yeah. what it was uh but you got to have your map and compass yeah so that's your backup to your whatever electronic navigation and communication that you're going to have the map and compass is there mm. your backup to your communication in the case of an emergency you should have flares yep signal panel yeah you know oh, and your then, compass will have a mirror you're exactly and that's what but you want to get, bring another mirror because you get those nice little ones that you can aim but nonetheless hmm. redundancy is everything so as they you know i would like to say in the tactical operators world one is none yeah. two is one yeah it's true yeah. it's true we had a you know pro propane stove we were relying on a two burner propane stove in our uh, base camp and everybody of course had their you know their little uh, pack stoves i don't think uh, they had um what's the the one the jet boils right then but we were using little you know white gas pump up stoves yep. and stuff like that and of course our propane stove crapped out yep. because propane you know Again, you run that risk, you know, if you, it, it, and it was actually the stove, the jets and the stove wouldn't mm. work. So we did, you know, another eight, nine days of cooking just on the little backpack stoves, which mm. was fine, you know. Well, in the whole one is none, two is one, there is a limit to what you can haul on the plane, to what you can yep. haul on your back. Right. And so there, there has to start building some non-negotiables. If you're going up with a, a team, a group, you can start bringing in more equipment. Someone can have the... <laughs> Uh, the major parts of the tent, let's say, and the other person can have uh, the cookware and you can start sharing amongst each other and it wouldn't make sense for everyone to, to double up on those things. Um, but there are some things that you definitely would want to double up on. Yeah. What would you say are non-negotiables that you want to make sure that you, uh, you have sorted, you have maybe doubles of? Uh, I, I definitely two cooking systems because that did prove out. Okay. To say, oh, I can cook everything on a fire. What if you can't get a fire going if sure. it's that wet? Or you're so high in the alpine, you have no fuel. Right. And, and that's that's the other thing. So you get up into a lot of these sheep camps, they're, they're, there's no fire. That's stove-only right. operation. So you, you know, I mean, it's crazy in the north, the, you know, the, the, the weather, or not, I shouldn't say the ecosystems from, you know, one range to the next, you go to one and it's like, the Gobi Desert, you go to another, right. and, it's, and you go like, man, I didn't think anybody could be that wet up here, you yes. know? And and it's just shocking. It's it's and also, I mean, you can actually walk from one area to another and be surprised, mm -hmm. you know, in, in your hunt as to how. But 
get mountain back. weather changes. I would definitely have two cooking systems. Okay. I would definitely have, in addition to my shelter, backup shelter because we have been in hurricane force winds. Yes. And if you you know went cheap and didn't get a decent tent and that thing blows its moorings, you're done. You're done. Then you shelter, shelter shelter is everything. So you need, you know, a sill tarp or something Perfect. of that nature that you can put together a hasty shelter if you lose your, your principal shelter. It won't be pretty, won't but be you'll pretty. be alive. That's right. You've got to get out of that wind, out of that rain, out of mm-hmm. that storm. Um, we had a, uh, the wind was going so hard, we broke a, a fiberglass tent pole. Right. And it broke between the joints. And, you know, you think... How am I going to fix this? I fired off a cartridge, 30 out six. I took my leather man out. I worked for quite a while, but I cut the head off. Yeah. And then I pushed the two pieces into the 30 out six cartridge and then taped it up with duct tape. And, you know, that held, wasn't pretty. That's ingenuity. And that it, goes back to what we were st- talking, the mindset and ingenuity at the beginning. Yeah. You get, you should be prepared. So, but uh, the other thing that I would definitely have a backup on. You don't have to have the same kind of boots, but you certainly need to be able to preserve your feet. Mm. So you should have a change of footwear. Okay. Quite often, you know, if you're going to be hunting off of a lake, you might be taking water out of the lake. So a pair of these, you know, mock uh, Irish setter, bogs, mm-hmm. I'm trying to get to hit all the big ones, yeah. you know, Huntsworth, all these, you know, high top rubber boots that have a bit of insulation that have a nice tight ankle fit. So in a pinch, you can pack with them. You can walk and everything else like that. Mm. I'm not talking, you know. Big old gum boots. Yeah, the old Army and Navy red bottom black tops that you used to get when you went back to school in the fall. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Uh, But, you know, those good quality rubber boots to back up your mountain boots. Mm. And and you need, of course, you know, a good sturdy set of of boots. So, and in addition to... I, I just, if you can only take the one pair of boots, you still got to save your feet at some point. Crocs or sandals. Crocs, yeah, Crocs yeah. or sandals. And Crocs weigh nothing. You can even get, you know, those other ones that are now super air light and, and things like that. And those are absolute lifesavers on a, you know, when you've been on your dogs all day, you got to get your boots dried out. You've got to get uh, get your feet back in shape. Those those can or save river it. crossings. True R- enough. Roll, roll up the the True. take your pants off. Yep, and yep. throw your Crocs on to save your feet because yep. if you if you bugger your feet, your your trip. That's right. Buggered. Yeah, barefooting across the stuff is not the way to go. It's at, not if you can avoid it. Yeah, and it, everything is sharp. <laughs> of and course. It, if it didn't look sharp, you're going to find just how sharp it was <laughs> as soon as you put your bare feet in there. No, it, the Croc. Yeah. So footwear. Absolutely, you've got to have a backup on that. Mm. Um, the rifle, we kind of talked about, not super essential. Most rifles, you know, and, and that maybe was the error I made. That rifle had basically been sighted in, broken in, but it hadn't been used. That was the first hunt that rifle went on. Went on. Mm. It didn't bloody anything on that, and I was, you know, we were in grizzly country as well, yeah. so you, you may need that firearm for that. So. You- you know what else I will bring with me? A slingshot and a, a small spin caster. And I don't pack them with me. I'll stow them someplace. But I know if I need food, hopefully I can catch fish if I'm in an area. Hopefully right. I can get a, a ptarmigan or, or, or something. Gross. Yeah, it's it's funny how, I you know, the poor fool hand has been called the fool hand. And, and I remember as a kid, you know, listening to all these hunters saying, oh, yeah, they just stand there. You go whack them with a stick. I've never seen one I could have whacked with a stick. I've seen a couple. Maybe if I had been, you know, highly adept with a throwing stick, might have been able to get. I might have. I've got them with a uh, throwing knife, younger. Yeah. And um, it actually hit backwards, but it did the trick. Yeah. And, uh, and a rock. But uh, most of the time... You just got to be either a really good shot or really lucky when you're throwing these yeah. things, because if you're not, they're 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 up and they're gone. Right, and but that is that's a great way to supplement your diet while you're on there too. So mm. you know what, I'd be more inclined to put a 22 in there somewhere. And you get, you know, yeah, you get a little undersized kid size 22 doesn't weigh anything. 
Yeah, you know, good and, point. And the ammo's cheap. Little game getter. Yeah, little game getters is worth having. Yeah. I mean, if you, you know, tag out, of course, then you're going to be able to supplement uh, with the, the tenderloins or something of that nature. Mm-hmm. You know, you can eat the tongue, the heart, all that is more protein while you're there. Uh, but, uh, like you say, you know, nothing more frustrating to be on one of these hunts and maybe it's a, it's a down day. You've got to do some firewood gathering or whatever. It's handy to pack that little 22 around and like, you know, get some yeah. ditch chickens ditch as it. Adam Bach would like to say, uh, <laughs> and, uh, bring those back. I think it's disrespectful to call them ditch chicken. A ditch chicken. I just like to call them delicious. Delicious. Yeah. So, uh, what we eat when we're on a fly in hunt is something that, if you're expending a lot of energy, you're going to need calories. And some people say you can't eat enough calories to make up for what you're expending. I don't know if that's true, but I think when it comes down to what you're able to pack in, your options start to get limited. So knowing, like, typically I like sweet things. I got a bit of a sweet tooth. Mm-hmm. If I'm in the mountain, I remember one of my first times going out and I packed some sweets because I figured, you know, it's going to be some good energy. I had a hard time choking this stuff down after a while. I, I found I craved fatty and salty foods just to try and, re, I guess, replace re- electrolytes. Hawkins cheesies, for me, have been a lifesaver because it gives you some food in your belly. They're and nice and light to pack along. They're a little bulky, but yeah. Oh, I, I love them. I love them because of the the amount of um, calories that they, they end up giving you. And then like gummies, a little... Um, gummy that you can put in your mouth when you're hiking or you're moving. It just kind of keeps your, uh, your blood sugar level up and it keeps the attitude in the right place. Yeah. You know, and, and we planned on going on these trips, you know, lots of times. And the, and the idea is a lack of refrigeration. So right. taking fresh food is not necessarily an option, but often it's the fresh food that has the higher caloric mm. content to it to get you through. So, um, apples, Dried apples, dried fruits, you know, those are all fairly high in the sugar and the carbohydrates that you need for that boost of energy. Mm. But you're right. In the long run, it's the fats that are going to keep you warm and, and, and go through. So if you can get, you know, that um, attitude. I mean, freeze-dried food. You look, and the calories on those are only like five or 600 Right. You know, per package, which is making you think of something right now. It was making me think of the freeze-dried food. We make got a bunch of this silver core freeze dried food, which I've been yeah. testing out different recipes and different kinds and I should actually find it. I think I brought some around here with me somewhere, but, uh, oh, it's in the kitchen, is it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we'll uh, pick it out after. Yeah. We can add that in, but, but that's, you know, one of the things is that's great. It's super convenient. It feels good to, you know, to just heat that up and get that in you and it's easy to you know there's no cooking you just pour some boiling water in there let the thing set do whatever it is put your tent up while Mm. while the you know the the reconstitutes and then you eat and it's a real kind of filling hearty flavorful thing to get in you Mm. but you're not really getting the calories so power bars and cookie bars and and all of those things need to keep going in you while you're going through Mm. um you know that you got to figure what your average person is going to burn, you know, a man's going to a couple thousand calories in a day. You go and you start going up, you know, near vertical <laughs> mountainsides, carrying 60 pounds on your back at times, you know, all the other physical exertion and, and keeping warm. Right. Because you don't burn calories when you come in and you have a beautiful fire next to you, you know, mm. we're not burning calories now, but just sitting glassing is burning calories because mm-hmm. your body's trying to keep itself warm. And there is a, a degree of acclimatization that you will find too if you if you really haven't spent, you know, my whole life has been, you know, going from living in a house to going out there and hanging right. out in the outdoors for a while. And I always feel a little cold in the first bit, but then that goes away. You get used to it. Right. And then you come home and you can't like, oh, I yeah. can't stand this. Way too hot. The only thing I like is the running water yeah. when you get home, the hot running water. That's good. But, you know, sometimes it's just too hot. Mm-hmm. You know, and and you struggle with that, but once you get acclimatized, what's happening is your body's burning those calories. So you gotta you gotta keep it up. You really gotta you gotta pick the food. There's lots and lots of great uh, YouTube channels talking about that. Okay, so I got up, I checked it out. Uh, calories, one thousand and ten per serving. And you will not, you know, not tastes shame, delicious, sh- delicious, sh- delicious, yeah, <laughs> absolutely delicious. Shameless plug because it is a silver core product, but that's 
sure. far exceeds anything you're going to find, uh, you know, at, at some of the other places you might shop at. I mean, I think talking about food would be a whole podcast on its own. And I, I'm going to, I've got some ideas of people that you should bring on for mm. that, uh, that are, you know, really got it figured. And, you know, that is going to come from, you know, the, the backpackers handbook, right? You know, mm-hmm. those, those guys got that stuff figured. So you want to hunt, that's one thing you want to hunt out of a backpack. You should talk to a backpacker and see what the, what they do. Right. Okay. All right. So. We're talking about things that would essential uh, for redundancy: shelter, fire starting. Okay, mm-hmm. now, yeah, bring some paper and bring some fire starting cubes for sure. But make sure that you know how to make a fuzz stick with your knife. Yeah. Make sure that when your bic lighter runs out and all you got is spark, that you know how to, you know, that you've got some form of tinder that will get your kindling to go. You know, uh, setting. F- a fire, and you know, and, and processing firewood on these trips is important. I've gone with only a bow saw and, right. and an axe, um, and that's going light. And you know what? You got plenty of time on your hands, but it is a calorie expenditure. Uh, if you've got enough food, then that's fine. Then then you know, go because a lot of these like silky silky boy saws. Yep. Those things just fly through, you know, stuff yep. that's up to six inches, and it's really not a great amount of effort that you need to do that. Uh, but having a little, you know, fourteen-inch bar chainsaw has gone on a lot of fly-in trips with us. Okay. And uh, we'll just the dog here. Yeah, he's pulling on my wire. Though I can't say that. <laughs> uh, the uh, but having a chainsaw has has been great because in a lot of cases, you know, that's your. You know, coming home at the end of a, a long day's hunting is nice having that fire at night to keep you warm and, you know, in the social side of the fire. But definitely redundancy and your, you know, your your fire preparation tools. And, you know, if you're going to bring power saw, then you need an axe, you know, because mm-hmm. when the you run out of gas for the power saw or you pinch the bar in a tree, now you've got nothing. So an axe is important. Mm-hmm. You can use the axe to get the saw out of the tree and all these sure. things. Um, knives. Right. We all have our favorite hunting knife. But you know what you need in addition to your hunting knife is you need a multi-tool. Mm. You'd be crazy not to go with a multi-tool. Yeah. I think the minimum, though, for me would be my hunting knife. If I couldn't bring a multi-tool, because they are kind of heavy, but not that heavy. Uh, would also be a, a large, um, more of a bushcraft knife than a hunting knife. I mean, I right. can still use it for, for game preparation, but if I'm packing out from a base camp or if I'm going into a spike camp, that big knife can be a godsend because mm-hmm. you can baton it through to split wood. You can chop small you know, wood for processing for your firewood. So mm-hmm. that kind of a knife. So let's, you know, ideally... Money's no object. Chainsaw, chainsaw fuel. Um, if weight is a concern, then a good quality like a Silky Boy style saw or one of the other folding type buck saws. Those can, and I don't mean made by buck, but uh, that. And then the other thing about those saws too is you're going to have to process your game. Mm-hmm. The saw is going to be very handy. Uh, an axe, uh, probably like a forest axe size, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't really need a giant heavy splitting maul because it's a lot of weight to pack in, but that forest axe, you can process, you know, six inch rounds, no problem by splitting it. Uh, you can use it for cracking pelvis. You can use yeah. it, you know, for, uh, opening up the sternum, all yeah. those sorts of things. So that, that axe, no saw, axe, yeah. big knife. You're probably okay if that's how you're going to want to look on a minimalist approach. You know, I generally always have a little axe, whether it be a little Gerber or I think Sog makes one, but they're yeah. they're lightweight, they're small, they're sharp, they're durable. And I've got one in my vehicle. If I'm going out and I'm doing a, um, a backpack hunt, a truck hunt, a fly-in hunt, I've always got in one of the little pockets in my pack, a little, little axe, because it's amazing. Your tent pole goes down, if you can set something up chop something down. Uh, yeah, you're yeah. out on my, my side-by-side. I've got a little ax in the glove compartment. Yeah. It takes a while, 
but you can actually take care of some pretty big I, obstacles. Yeah, no, I like, I got my Alta Force, you know, and that's razor sharp. Yeah. It's not a great axe for splitting or anything else, but it will split. Yeah. I can certainly clear brush with it. I can process firewood. I can, you know, do anything else. And I just love that axe to, to bits. You know, that's, it's a, it's always with me. It's always on my, if, if I'm not uh, using a pack board, it's always on my day pack, always. And, uh. On the opposite side of my rifle. Rifle goes here, handle of the axe is by my ear over here, but it's always there. So for sleeping, are you a, a down or synthetic type person? Synthetic. Yeah? Yeah. You know. <sighs> down is lightweight. It's compressible. It's, it's got all these great things. It's super warm, you know, all this thing. But boy, when you're wet, you're, it's toasterama, man. Yeah. And you are invariably either going to you know, get wet from frost or you're going to get wet from just, you know, condensation within the tent. Yes. All this is. Now we have this vision of going up North and you know, it's going to be super cold. Hmm. Most of the times, if you're in that, you know, even in the Northern Rockies, uh, up in the Cassiars on the lakes. Okay. I'm not talking at, you know, top elevation, but you know, we've seen temperature fluctuations from, like I say, 90 degrees during the day, which is a real anomaly. Mm. But most of the time it runs around four to six degrees Celsius during the day and gets down to minus 10, minus 12 sometimes at night. Right. So, you know, the need for a huge, you know, Trapper Nelson type, uh, you know, those old pioneer bags, yeah. sure, they'd be nice because you just throw them on the ground, yeah. but you don't really need it. A good synthetic bag, even though it may not be as, as compressible. You're going to be warm and warm. Yeah, you know, be- I got a, this crazy, these Thinsulite bags I, I got years ago, and I still use them. They're mummy bags, and man, they work really well, and they are tiny when they're packed up, but mm. they, you know, they will take you down. So again, do you want to trade off? It's all about backpacking again. What are the backpackers saying? Talk to them. Mm. But if you want to get a, you know, a small bag, and then what you do is you wear your layers underneath. You're going to wear clothing, a beanie, uh, you know, keep your socks on when you go to bed and stuff. And, and the clothing system that you use, you're going to want to have a hard shell so that yep. you're able to be waterproof. You're going to want to have... Uh, Water windproof. Water and windproof. You're going to want to have an insulating layer. You're going to want to have some wicking layer underneath. And it's one of these places where you can cut a lot of weight because you're probably going to be wearing basically the same thing all the time. It's not like in in your built up areas you're from where you're going to be changing does, into something nice and new. Extra clothes, you know, do do take up a ton of room and weight. We've often though, you know, reward yourself about halfway through the trip by having a, you know, Clean boiling skitties. up a lot of water and you know changing out your underwear yeah. and maybe your you know your your mid layer, yeah. right? Most of the time now, I would stay away from traditional style clothing, like a button-up shirt with a collar. Mm-hmm. Everything you should be wearing, you know, should be super thin next to your body, wicking, then your mid-layer, then you start maybe getting an insulating layer of either, you know, merino wool or or some of these finer down products, you know, or synthetic, or synthetic down synthetic, products. Yeah. Uh, that would be good, um, but by all means, having that ability to get the shell on. So if... You know that when you've got every piece of clothing on, you're good for minus 20, mm. uh, but you can also vary what you have in those layers back and forth. We always talk about the importance of breaking in that clothing as well and trying it out. You know, you, you don't want to head out there uh, and not know. And then that goes back to some of our other lessons on that. But mm. your, your pack-in trip like this may require a little bit more specialized clothing, but nonetheless... The most important thing I always say is at night when it's bedtime, you don't go to bed in the clothes that you're, you wore all day. Right. You got to go to bed in dry clothes. So mm. even if you're switching out, you get up in the morning, it's awful cold to get naked and get into those slightly damp clothes that you sweat in the day before. Yeah. Keep that sleeping stuff dry. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, even the beanie and everything else, that'll, that'll make for a huge issue. And can we actually just one step back on the, yeah. on the sleeping side of things? Super important to keep some form of insulation between you and the ground. You have to have it. So all of these new inflatable mats that are out there from climate and thermarest and, and mm. the like that, uh, you know, they have that ability to give you that R value between the ground and your sleeping bag. Cause remember, you know, 
as soon as you're in your sleeping bag, you've taken away all the insulating value as your body crushes it down, yep. right? So that's the, the importance of the pad. Air mattresses. I've seen so many guys, you know, bring a nice big thick, you know, air bed in. So, you know, I, I'm tired of sleeping so close to the ground, I'm going to be covered, and they freeze to death. Mm -hmm. So um, if you need it, you know, you can buy. I have, Climate has an awesome thick mattress, which only folds up to about that big. It's not too big, but once it's inflated, it it really gives you, uh, you know, a lot of cushioning, but also a lot of insulation value because inside, down by the feet, it's just air chambers. Mm -hmm. But up where your body is, it's got, you know, a foam, like a, a high, a low density foam. But mm. of course that's, you know, your body's able to heat that up. So those inflatable mattresses, in my opinion, are, are a godsend. I mean, I'm a side sleeper and I need to side sleep. Otherwise I'm not going to have a good sleep. I'll be snoring all night long. Yeah. Um, those inflatable thick ones are great. Putting something down between that inflatable thick layer, even if it's just a bit of a tarp or something, a little, keep it from getting from abrasions or from yep. pops and bringing an emergency patch kit are so needed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's again in your, you know, being prepared for any emergency. So how will this piece of kit fail me? Mm -hmm. So if it, you know, a catastrophic failure means you've got to go to plan B, which is now head off and get a whole bunch of hemlock boughs and, and put those down to, to cushion you from the ground because mm -hmm. they will cushion you and more importantly, they will insulate you, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and if it gets down to where you're, that's what you're going to do, or if that's your plan right from the beginning, you should practice that an awful lot mm -hmm. before you get up there and, and, and know, you know, there's hemlock in the North, but most of it's, you know, spruce and spruce isn't right. quite as nice to lay on as, as hemlock, you know, and, and, and so on. Um, what can go wrong? Some people get these cots as well. Mm -hmm. And again, with a cot, you're, it's getting that R value between the cold air space between the ground and the cot and your sleeping bag. So you still need the air mattress. I don't know whether the cot on its own is, is the greatest idea. You know, it's certainly for comfort, for a side sleeper, it would be good. Mm. But still having that, you know, thermarest climate pad or whatever in there. There is another thing that people might want to think about, depending on the area that they're going to, is predatory protection. So I bring a an electric fence, super lightweight. There's a company in Alaska that makes these things. Yeah, nine volt battery. Yeah, I think this is on double A's. Yeah, and, oh, but, it's, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's a series of them. So it's probably the same kind of voltage and it beeps. You get a little bit of a beep beep every so often. And that's a nice comforting beep as you're going to sleep that you know that the thing's working. If you stop hearing that beep, you realize time to change those batteries. I have not invested in one of those. I do recommend them. I think it's a great idea. Uh, what we've done is just, there's litter everywhere in the North. So even if you don't bring tin cans in, you can pretty quick find, you know, a half a dozen tin cans, fishing line strung around your camp. Hmm couple of stones in there. It's a classic early warning system, you know, mm. for, for predators coming around. Right. Yeah. Predators. I guess we've got to talk about that. Where did we go? We were talking about bedding. We yes. were talking about layered clothing. Predators are a very real thing and keeping a sloppy camp may not be the best idea. Watch the prevailing wind. The wind's coming from my back, blowing towards you. So I'm where my camp is going to be, where my tent is going to be, in my tent. No toothpaste, no feminine products, no nothing in my tent except me, my sleeping gear, and my clothing. Mm -hmm. My cooking area, it moves as we go, you know, we follow the wind. So if a predator is following the wind backwards, he's going to encounter all these other things. I'm going to be, you know, while I'm sleeping in my tent, the last thing that they're going to find. But mm -hmm. my cooking food preparation area and fire, my food cache, minimum 16 feet in the air. Mm -hmm. What's really wild when you go up to the north, uh, you're not going to end up in being the first person that's ever camped in that place on a lake. You might be, when you spike out up onto the mountainside, mm -hmm. you know, nobody slept in that little, you know, crevice that you found up there. But down on the lakeside, they're all got camps all over them. Mm -hmm. And often what's happened is, if you're hunting in one of the northern parks, BC parks, 
they have gone in their personnel and put uh, cable up in the trees and put a piece of conduit, plastic conduit over the cable. So you get your rope over there and you can use it like a hoist to get your stuff well up off the ground. Mm -hmm. You'd be a fool not to do that. I uh, 100% you'd, agree. You'd be a fool not to do that. Your game pole. Again, as high as you can make it, you know, we use a little bit of ingenuity to figure out, uh, you know, how to build a ladder, bushcraft ladder to get up there, but that get that game pull up. And often the game that you deal with in those circumstances, you're going to have boned out anyway. So it's mm -hmm. not like hauling a, a quarter of moose way up in the air. You're going to, you know, have a, a game bag full of meat, uh, which again, two of you or some, even a little pulley, like to go with these block and tackles. If you're going heavy camping, if you're going in, you know, with, you know, money to burn, that's fine. Maybe you want to bring a real block and tackle in, but in a lot of cases, you know, your 550 paracord is what you're, you're going to pull your game meat up there with. So an adequate pulley to put through that, or if you're lucky enough to find one of these camps that have the, the conduit uh, system, it's excellent and not too close to the trees because we always think about grizzly bears, but the north abounds with black bears mm -hmm. and they can climb trees like nobody's business. So tell me, um, I keep a tiny little Garmin, uh, I think they call it a temp, T-E-M-P-E, -E, but it's, it communicates with my watch. It tells me what the temperature is outside based on my pack as opposed to the temperature from my wrist, which is going to be throwing it off a little bit. So I can kind of keep an eye on a food safe range for any meat that I down. You find yourself out there. And it's a balmy, hot day. What are you doing with your meat? Oh, that's a great question because that has has happened more than once. Now, I'm going to proudly brag that the only meat we ever lost once was a moose that we'd uh, dropped in the evening. And when we got back to it the next day, the, the grizzlies had been on. I mean, we mm -hmm. packed out what we could in the initial go. Uh, we took out the tenderloins, backstraps, and I think... Uh, a portion of one of the hind quarters, but mm. uh, that was it on the first leaving. When we came back, the rest was gone. So that's a loss of meat. But to spoilage, we've been very lucky. Uh, I find that as long as the temperature sort of stays about eight degrees or below, it's not a concern. It mm. can just hang there and, and, it's, and it's good. We try and find a good shady place always for our game pole. And if you can get kind of close to the lake again so that you know not only we're talking about prevailing winds from camp and and you know just predator protection mm -hmm. but if you can get it down there where the air is moving over it as well that um oh, what's the correction it's not condensation but the uh evaporative effect right. can also help to cool the meat as right. as the meat dries it it actually kind of cools from that right evaporative effect so those are the, the right things to do. And we should all know that, you know, we should know how to hang meat from just, you know, our, our hunting experiences in the past. However, we have really got a spike in temperature, uh, get into the meat where it starts to lose its crust. What we've done is taken totes and put totes into the lake, mm. putting, you know, rocks in the bottom of the tote plus the weight of the meat, but putting the tote in. Uh, putting the, the lid back on the tote, covering it up with branches so mm -hmm. it's shaded and the coolness of the lake. Because I'm telling you, those lakes up there are cool. Oh, yeah. they're all the time. There's, yeah. there's, you know, the odd time I've taken a dip in there to try and get cleaned off. They are cold. Right. Cold. Which kind of brings another point too. Um, be very careful on any of these trips because again, help is a ways away, a couple hours at best, you know, even with your communicator and something stupid is that, you know, what that cold shock that you can get from jumping into a lake. Yes. You know, it's a very real thing. Yeah. You don't want to do that. You don't want to risk anything. Mm -hmm. If, if, you know, if you're going to cross water and there's like a big slimy pole there that you think, well, I'll just, you know, walk across like the Great Willenda or something like that. That's not a good idea. You can slip, break a leg, do all sorts of things. So stripping down with your Crocs wading across, using, you know, walking sticks or another thing that are always helpful on those. Mm -hmm. um, Extra caution. Yeah. Don't take risks, you know. Uh, yeah, don't take risks. Because you jeopardize everybody else that's on the trip as well. Because mm -hmm. if you do something that now they have to rescue you or you have to be evacuated or treated or, or something of that nature, you, everybody else has got to risk themselves to help you out. Mm-hmm. I mean, we still haven't 
gonna, you know, we are gonna have to do a session two where we're gonna have to do like a gear loadout almost. Maybe that's what we're gonna have to to try and talk about. But uh, again, keep in mind on these things um, to keep your equipment uh, redundant. That you've got a, a backup plan for every single piece of equipment you have. Say so if that thing fails, what have I got to back it up? And usually, you know, you're pretty safe with one backup. Mm. Uh, I always say, and uh, you know, so that's be prepared. Be a good Boy Scout if you're going to do this. Consider all the the ins and outs of it. Um, another thing always comes up. Well, what's the right caliber for this stuff? Well, we talked a lot about we you did know, caliber selection and everything else. If I were to say now on one of these northern hunts, I would probably opt for more horsepower. Mm. You know the 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 six point five Creedmoor craze is there. The six point five PRC great cartridges. Sure, we talked about you know the effectiveness based on their sectional. I want some horsepower. I'd be going the three hundred PRC that you got there. Well, yeah, <laughs> but I mean that thing's you know that, that's a heavy that honks. that's a heavy rifle to carry around. It does what it's supposed to do, and it does it very well. Mm. But I'd be I'd be kind of inclined to be looking at uh, a three hundred Win Mag or something like that. Right. Uh, 300 short mag, either seven millimeter or 30 caliber, uh, that, you know, that's, that's got some, some set down power because knock on wood. And as you're putting wood in the fireplace, yes. um, we never, uh, have actually had to shoot a grizzly bear on any of these trips. We've seen plenty. Right. Uh, and you want to have an effective firearm for that. Right. A lot of times we talk about, you know, we always bring a, a shotgun for camp. No, we're talking about a small game getter. Yeah, if you bring a, a shotgun along, then some seven and a half shot, buckshot, uh, and, you know, for whatever predators and slugs, of course, for bears. Right. Having a light on that shotgun is pretty handy. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we have gone out for recovering game in absolute pitch dark. And a headlamp and a scoped rifle is about as useless as, pardon my language, a tits on a turkey. Right. Uh, there is, that is not going to work for you. You need to, you know, your headlamp, of course, for navigation, but you need a lighted uh, forend on that firearm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even if you, you know, the, like it would be nice, your backup firearm, if you want to take a third firearm or whatever, in case a rifle breaks, something like a forty five seventy with a little short Picatinny rail to put a light on, hmm. that'll be a help. You know, that'd be a help. What about water? So everyone's got their different Ooh, ideas yeah. on water. I think this would be a good one to chat about. First couple of trips, we're filtering our water. Hmm. If you're on a glacier lake, that, you know, sort of milky, milky blue, can't see through, the filter just plugs right yeah. up. And what we found was, uh, of a group of five on that one trip, two guys got really bad diarrhea, and it had to be waterborne. You sure. Know? And, and so the filter gets as much as it does. We switched out, take a, you know, it, and if space allows, take a food-grade five gallon bucket which is good for your load in because mm. you put stuff in it to bring in but you take you fill that bucket up you put water treatment in there let it settle the all of the you know the solids all that you know glacier silt will settle to the bottom and you'll have a nice you know safe water to drink mm -hmm. if you don't like the taste of that water purifier then you know systems like uh well grail and uh Katie Dine, and I think there's other ones where you just sort of scoop the water, push the press down, right. and it looks just like a regular water bottle. That tends to take that taste out. Yeah. You know? Yeah, they work well. I mean, and then your redundancy to all this, if you were to lose your treatment, boil your water. Mm -hmm. Boil it. Yeah. You know, to, to go through. I would, I would treat all the water I'm going to drink because, you know, hey, it's a pristine looking creek now, and we've learned enough that, you know, there's a dead moose 100 feet up there that you can't see, smell, or whatever, mm. and he's rotting in that creek, and you start drinking, getting that bacteria, or, you know what, 
I heard a caribou's gone by, and every one of them's had a leak in that water <laughs> before you you drink it. It's a problem, you know. It, it's a pretty simple precaution to take. Oh, if totally. you have it, bring it. It's, it takes up so little so little room. Treat yeah. your water. Yeah, and and you know, life straw and you know, Grail and all those other systems for filtering the water are so much better than what they used to be. Those little those little water pumps, the little handheld yeah. ones. Yeah, they can be great. You find a little. Maybe you can't get your canteen or your water bottle and to scoop it up, but you can pump it out of there. Right. And then you put your water purification in. Yeah. I, I've got a little uh, pocket bellows I'll bring with me. Yeah. I use this pocket bellows for starting fires so you're not breathing in it in and it takes up no room. I keep it in my bino pouch. Super handy little thing. But you can uh, pump water with it too. Well, the other thing is it works as a straw. <laughs> I mean, I've been out there and I mean, your parched water's gone and you're in a pinch. Get it in below the scummy layer on the top. Drink something from yeah. underneath. So I've, I've been there. I've been lucky. I've been lucky with the, um, uh, never having Giardia or anything like this, no. but wh- why leave it up to luck? Right. Purify. And now we, you know, the D word, and I don't mean Dallas, hmm. uh, diarrhea or other ailments and everything else. When you go on these trips, you should have a good broad spectrum set of medications, you know, for headaches, for muscle cramping, all these things. Because if you don't drink enough water, you're going to get muscle cramps. Yep. So it's nice to be able to treat that so you can sleep. There's a whole host of things that will make that trip that much more enjoyable. But make sure you've got anti-diarrheal, stomach medicine, yep. uh, all the Some different anal- analgesics and, and so on. And all that goes with a first-rate first aid kit, mm. you know. Uh, people often think associated to hunting are going to be gunshot wounds, which we really know is not not really the truth. Sprains uh, and breaks and incised wounds it sure. seems to be the worst thing that I've encountered time and time again. Sure. Because you know you're either sharp hunting knives up inside the cavity of an animal or broken bones or things like that. So yeah. make sure you're capable of doing that. Talk to your family doctor. He might be the kind of person that will give you a bit of a broad spectrum antibiotic that you can bring along with you so that if somebody does get cut early on the trip, they can start administering this stuff. You know, they can they can prescribe that for you just, you know, based on the faith that they know you that well or whatever, and, it, and it's worth a try. I had some buddies go up and do Denali, and their doctor prescribed them some morphine. Yeah. I don't know how many doctors will do that, but hey, they're able to head up there and do it. So maybe that's a relationship they have. Yeah, exactly. And that, and it's always nice, you know, firefighters are great hunting partners because they are super well-trained in first aid. Yes, they are. You know, and, and having a, you know, one of your, your hunting party being a firefighter is a good thing. There's mm-hmm. my, as a police officer, a shameless plug for a former <laughs> police officer. Um, the, uh. Oh, I was going to say something else about the first aid kit. It just popped out of my head. Crazy glue, sutures, oh, compression. Yeah, and and if if everybody could take a first aid course before you go on one of these, it's extremely important. Sure, uh, very duct, important. Duct tape, man. I use duct oh. tape for everything. I and I wrap it around my water bottles. Get good quality duct tape. And I've got someone, some water bottles out here that have been sitting out in the rain forever. You can still peel it off and it yeah. still sticks. Gorilla, gorilla tape yeah. is good because you'd also use it as a fire starter. Yes. You know, you need to, you know, have a, a good amount. And again, just like you say, Sue, so, you know, your, your, your fire steel, your ferrocellium rod yeah. to wrap that around, make a knob on the end of it, but do it with gorilla tape so you yeah. can peel that off. Um, the uh, make sure that you've got that tape for repairing everything. Gorilla tape will often make an airtight seal on your air mattress too. If you know the first, you know attempt at, at, hmm. at sealing it up works. Okay, we tore the bottom out of a canoe once. Gorilla tape. Well, yeah, it was actually duct tape on that one. But what we did was we tore the keel out of a fiberglass canoe. We laid a round piece of willow in there. Yeah, and then we brought shoe goo. Okay. Which is another great product. And so we use the gorilla t- or the duct tape, shoe goo, and we were able to make the, the canoe waterproof again, which gave us the ability to get. You're going in with a lot more kit than I'm going in with. I'm, I'm coming up no, to this c- conclusion much. here. If, if, if everybody's got a, you know, a roll of tape, if everybody's got a little bit of shoe glue, and it doesn't weigh much, yeah. you know, it's good. Speaking of shoes and feet. Hmm. Man, oh man, you've got to have blister remedy with you. So duct tape. 
Yeah, duct tape will actually work. Um, there's some other products that are a little nicer uh, that'll stay on your feet for quite a while too. There's different types of tape, but you can't fool around. As soon as you get a hot spot on your foot, you got to treat it. You got to right. you got to get that blister prevented or, or protect. You know, that's uh, a very interesting point talking about stopping and treating it. So uh, many years back, buddy of mine just came out of the British military. He'd done SAS selection a couple of times. He's been on the podcast here in the past and he says, Trav, I'm, I'm going to go do hike some of the hills around here. You want to come along? Absolutely I do, right? So I, I go on out there. Geez, what boots should I use? Everyone's raving about these Danner boots. Totally inappropriate boot for me. And boots are such a personal thing that mm-hmm. you can never say, this is the best boot to get. People have to try it out and figure yeah. it out for themselves. Anyways, I, I'm going out there and uh, there's another fellow with us as well. We're hiking up the mountainside and he's getting some hot spots on his feet and Man, I'd had hot spots for quite some time already, but I can't say nothing, right? This guy just got out of the British military, done SAS selection. I'm keeping my mouth shut, plugging along. Let's do our thing. I don't want to be looking like a wuss on this. The other guy says, oh, you know, my feet are kind of bothering me. He's like, stop, sit down, take off your boots, address them, he says. Okay, administrate yourself. Okay, so he's doing his thing and I'm looking and, oh, maybe I should do the same thing. Going up the mountain, the guy's kind of shivering. He's like, hold on, stop. Get, get your uh, get your jacket on, warm up, right? And it was a very different mindset than how I was raised and what I was used to. I was always raised and used to be tough, keep going, don't complain, right? And we can power through this, there'll be a deadline or a finish line, and then you can warm up and nurse your wounds afterwards. This guy goes on and on and on. He doesn't pick the fastest pace. He's not screaming through. But whenever there's an issue, you need some food, you stop, get some food in, get going. You need your feet done, you stop, you address your feet. And that little mindset, which turns out is a special forces mindset, what a game changer to the comfort level and ability just to enjoy your hunt, your hike, your your backcountry adventure. Like I spent the next two and a half, three weeks in flip-flops because I had such huge scabs on the back of my feet after that, that I couldn't get shoes on. So stopping the second you get a hot spot. The second you start getting a little bit cold, put something on right. before it gets too far because there's nobody going to be out there to to fix that for you. Yeah, and keep watching your your partners that are with you because we're not Good all point. we all don't have the same metabolic rate or or you know, energy level or anything else like that because and being the tough guy doesn't do the group help. And let's skip all the way back to the beginning of this. How much did this thing cost? Mhm. So why ruin you know, something that I've invested quite a bit of money to be out there to do. Right. By not taking five minutes out of my day to get my socks off, treat my dogs, put my socks back on and continue on. Right. Speaking of which, another little helpful hint, which I know I've offered up as a pro tip in the past, but Gore-Tex socks. You can't help but get your boots soaked through. You take your wet socks off, you put dry socks on, you put a set of Gore-Tex socks on, put your wet boots, you know, try and yeah. blot as much water out, but put your Gore-Tex socks back on and you can walk with dry feet again. And often you can walk your boots dry over a day or so as well with that, even though you're not having to put them to a fire to warm them up or dry them, anything like that. Well, you had that other tip as well, that sham wow tip. Yeah, well, that's it. At night, uh, carry those little sham wows, twist them up, put them up inside your boot and it works like a capillary siphon to, right. to take the water out. So toes up. Shamwow up inside. And you can also use it on the inside of your tent to dry Everything, things yeah. off with all the condensation that you're going to get on a single wall tent. Any way, nothing. And and that's, you know, rather than being a terry cloth towel, get one of those microfiber towels, which yeah. same thing. You can use it for so many things and it doesn't take up any space or weight or anything like that. But you don't need like a, you know, a face towel, hand towel, bath towel, that sort of stuff. One of those little ones. And... Talking about keeping clean is keeping warm too, you mm-hmm. know, on the subject of towels. Make sure you bring along, you know, some scent-free, uh, biodegradable, you know, soap, you know, mm. like camp suds or something like that. You wash the dishes, wash your clothes if you need to, wash your, your body. It's all good. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the other things. Again, though, as much comfort as you want to have, um, being careful there's always liquor in my hunting camp, but you know, sometimes on these types of camps, take in just you know, a little bit of sipping liquor or something like that. It'll mm. cut way back. You can, don't bother bringing glass in. 
the, you yeah. know, that's kind of a, a personal request because glass either gets broken and never, never comes out or people say, oh, we'll just throw it in the fire and it turns to slag. Well, it doesn't really. Right. It's you know, still you, there. You still it's glass. still there. There's always glass. Uh, pack it in your garbage, you know. The ethos, pack it in, pack it know, out. Right. You know, just whatever you take it in. Now, I always say you got to burn your food scraps, you know, that helps with predators. Take your tin cans, burn them, but then take them out and smash them flat and then put them into a bag. But don't, there, there seems to be this mm, thought that went back because the guys who were in those, and, and that will be the shocking thing you will find when you go into these northern lakes and remote areas. There's people who have been there for 100 years before you. Sure. And you will find areas where people have, you know, dumped a whole bunch of cans into a, a hole in the ground and they're still there. Well, even going back further than that, yeah. there's like obsidian arrowheads and uh, mittens uh, and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Like people have been there. People have been there. Uh, fires. Another couple of things, you know, wherever you go, you go in and there's already an established fire pit, but for whatever reason, somebody says, well, I don't really like the view from that fire pit, so I'm going to put another fire pit there. So you've now created another 30,000 year scar on the ground, right? right? So just stick with, you know, what's there. Use what people have had. Cutting, cutting live trees. Uh, if you're operating in one of the northern parks up there, and many of these areas, you know, are, are parks. They're mm. regulated by BC Parks. You cannot cut the live uh, coniferous trees. That's a fine. Right. And have run into, you know, if you hear a helicopter coming, it's one of two things. It's somebody coming to rescue it, or it's going to be the CO. conservation officer service, and they usually come with the BC Parks ranger that it comes in there. Mm -hmm. And that ranger is looking to see what you've cut. Mm -hmm. And that can amount to quite a, a hefty fine. So there's no reason to cut. There is so much dead standing stuff. Um, if you're a, any one of the lake shores, you know, for firewood. And then, you know, if you do need structural things, cut the aspens. Nobody, you know, they're fine. Right. They grow right back. Cut the alder. Cut the, the willow and, and, and that type of, you know, um, weed tree, for lack of a better term. That That's all fine. Sure. They, they don't care about that. But when you're finished, if you've cut a bunch of tent poles from what's up there, Stand them up so they don't rot, and then the next person that arrives can use them to, to string their wall tent on or, yeah. or whatever they, they, they care to do. I think, you know, we it was a traditional thing to take, you know, a, a frameless wall tent in. And then cut your poles. Cut your poles and everything else. Today, there is such a variety of the hot tents that are out there, most of them like a, 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 a teepee style or, or something like that, but a, a, a circular, you know, allows uh, for your tall center pole to go up and that center pole can either be, you know, an expandable one that you brought, one that you cut, or you can actually use a little pulley system and pull the center of that thing up, a little small wood stove inside there, and you've got comfort beyond imagine, you know. You know who makes a really good, lightweight, spacious tent? Mm -mm. Brad Brooks from Our Galley. Oh, really? Past podcast guest. And yeah. uh, just Google up Our Galley. Check, check out the tents that he makes. He's was one of the consultants on some other big name, lightweight backcountry tents. Yeah. And he says, you know, I still have ideas. I still want to make innovations. And he's made those innovations within the tents that he has there. So I would definitely recommend people check that one out. Yeah. They're awesome. Well, that's going to be your home for while you're in there. Right. So you want to make sure that... You know, you, you've taken good accounts. I mean, we talked about bringing some tarps because you can't spend all your time in the tent. Uh, and if you get a big roaring fire outside, you know, it's nice to have uh, a bit of a tarp to reflect the heat back from sure. that fire onto your back yep. and also keep you out of the mist or whatever that's coming down at night. So we've covered a fair bit of ground oh, here. Man. You know, mindset going in, being... The group, the people that you're picking, making the decision whether you're going to go by yourself or with a group, understanding bush pilots and weather systems and how that's, there's no guarantees. There really, there is no guarantees. And just there's because no you're booked in with a pilot doesn't mean that you're necessarily taking Boy off. Boy Scout of attitude, be prepared. Be prepared. Um, communication systems, we touched a little bit on food. You're right, that is a much bigger area we could, uh, we could get into. Sleeping systems, both shelters, backup systems. Talked a bit about firearms. Um, 
I don't know if there's too much else within the scope of this that we can really be delving into, but there is minutia. You know, the basics, optics, firearms, that's all there. But I would just say with the firearms, opt for a bit of redundancy so that you do have, you know, some kind of a backup for the firearms. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you and I, if I was, you know, 40 years younger and we were going in on a sheep hunt, and we're going in on a in a 172 or a 182 or yeah. you know a, a, a small float plane onto a high altitude lake. It might be just backpack and a little box of you know snacks or something like that. So there, that redundancy thing's going to be way yes. off, right? You yes. know we're we're not going to have a whole ton of stuff. But if you and I and a couple other guys are going to you know pay for a, an otter flight in, we can be relatively comfortable. But be smart about it. You mm -hmm. know what we're bringing in. We want to have a good shelter. We want to have the ability to sit around the fire at night. Those things. Mm -hmm. You know, firearms. It remains the same. Optics remains the same. You know, those those things don't change too much. But the specialty specialness of of this remote, you know, um, pack in hunting trip requires that we do some some real thinking. Why don't we give it a wrap up right there? Okay. If people have uh, questions on specifics, we can always delve into the minutia, yeah. but this should give a good overall for people who are thinking about doing a fly and hunt, particularly in the British Columbia area. And uh, I mean, I've got pack lists. I'm sure you do too. I've got stuff we can put as offline assets and yeah. people are looking at what, uh, what we've used in the past and uh, they might even have suggestions that make it better for our next fly in that we're going to do together right where, where is that <laughs> yeah it's by whisper lake next to never never tell mountain that's in region nine. Oh, it well i think they moved it to region 10 by now oh is so, it yeah, okay. okay yeah no we'll we'll have a spot and we'll you know see if you can figure it out just like right here at fuddle duck lodge fuddle duck lodge mm -hmm.